there is this interesting phenomena though where now we're seeing china as, as sort of taking the lead and moving in this direction you, you talked about the um the belt and road initiative um in the book and i just really want to ask you because i really want to get a scale because there's something that is very like um you, you write about really clearly which is like we're in kind of this not kind of we are within the beginning of a mass extinction event. This has been defined as the sixth great mass extinction event on the earth. Um, we are what has been also described as the Anthropocene or, you know, this sort of age where we've entered into this, again, the mass extinction, but also just accelerated climate change. And um, obviously this is not a time to be undergoing massive infrastructure projects. This is probably a time where we should be scaling back and decommissioning a lot of the infrastructure that has been built throughout the, like, the 20th century. Um, but instead, it's going in the opposite direction. It's the Great Acceleration, as you described it as well. So I just really want, if you, if you have this information on, on hand or in your mind right now, just to give people a sense of scale of like what infrastructure looks like in the 21st century in comparison to the 20th century, uh, especially in regards to the Belt sure. uh, and Road Initiative. Yeah. Yeah, like part of what I'm referring to as infrastructural brutalism is the fact that in this historical context in which we live, the um, it is the sixth mass extinction event in the history of the planet. Um, you, you have the designation of the Anthropocene that, you know, mm -hmm. human activity is the equivalent of a geological force. Uh, and of course, it's not just, it's not human activity like, all humans, yeah. 5 billion human beings uh, live in poverty under mm. capitalism. So, you know, it's primarily the way a tiny minority of us live that mm -hmm. is causing this, this damage. And then you introduce into that. So, so in other words, Western uh, colonialism and capitalism sort of set the table um, by creating this mass extinction event. Uh, and then you introduce into that uh, one of the uh, global superpowers, China, um, introducing uh, back in 2013 a, a what they call the Belt and Road Initiative, which is the largest infra infrastructure initiative in history mm -hmm. uh, and involves uh, dozens of countries, over 70 countries, and it, it involves building more uh, rail lines, new uh, marine ports, uh, new paved roads. Uh, so it's this this massive, massive expansion of industrial infrastructure. And it's doing so in the context of a mass extinction event. Uh, so, uh, you know, instead of pumping the brakes, like capitalism is actually accelerating in the context of an extinction. And this is this is how we should look at all new uh, in infrastructure projects. Uh, not necessarily that that you cancel all of them, but but that you sort of assess them uh, for their carbon intensity. Uh, you assess them in terms of their uh, contribution of, of toxicity, mm -hmm. um, and some. You know, some we will have to sabotage because the 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 system is not going to simply step back from the abyss. Yeah. Like that's that's not how capitalism operates. It has to increase uh, primitive accumulation every year. It you know it, it it so there are the the dictates of the system that people are operating within. Uh, demand more destruction. I mean, that's basically what wealth under capitalism is. It's just subsidized destruction. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm kind of, I'm looking at this from the perspective of, uh, I guess, primarily from North of the Americas where uh, I don't, you know, I don't see uh, organizational efforts that are capable of taking down capitalism at the moment you know, there doesn't seem to be that kind of capacity on the horizon, but of course things can change quite rapidly, um, yeah. especially with the uh, uh, natural disasters that, you know, mm -hmm. are becoming more frequent. Like things can change under those conditions even faster. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just reading a, a very good book, um, Disaster Anarchy, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, about some of the mutual aid efforts 
uh, to sort of circle back to your question about COVID-19, like yeah. some of the mutual aid efforts during COVID-19 have um, have exhibited the value of uh, uh, anarchist uh, politics, mm. uh, especially in this this kind of moment. I'm I, I just actually wrote a piece about uh, the seawalls and um, uh, the rising sea levels and how you know maybe what we have to start thinking more about is is letting go of some uh seaside uh, urban developments yeah uh how, how how can we sort of finance an equitable retreat from some of these places whereas it, instead of instead of saying you know well we're going to we're going to build these massive concrete walls uh like in the in the film the anthropocene um mm-hmm. you know they there's a scene in china where this guy's been working on a seawall for decades and the seawall that he's building is there to protect an oil production facility and it's like one of these moments where hopefully the you know the viewers recognize the grim paradox of like protect and building a seawall to protect the industry that's literally contributing right. to the sea level rise in the first place mm-hmm. um uh, it, you know are there are there equitable ways that we can s- s- walk away from some of these uh uh sea seaside uh, urban developments instead of um you know i was looking at uh places like miami um you know which which will be underwater like at at some point like in you know in a century there's no question it's going to be most of it will be underwater but um the city of uh, miami i think it was miami beach is actually offering uh twenty thousand dollar uh first time home buyer uh loans (laughs) like (laughs) Like they're providing incentives for people to move into a place that is doomed eventually. And they're providing incentives for people to do things like raise their homes or, or build seawalls. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, so, but it, it's driven, it's driven not only by obviously, you know, uh, capitalism cares more about property than life. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's driven, driven by trying to desperately trying to preserve the property value where it is, it is doomed. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but you know, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's sort of like a, uh, also driven by the myth of progress. Like, you know, we can, we can overcome any obstacle, uh, with the the right amount of technological sophistication, um, and these infrastructural mega projects are are capable of you know overcoming any any sort of natural forces. Mm-hmm. Um, so so what what I was saying uh, uh, in infrastructural brutal, brutalism was you, you know building the largest infrastructure project in human history. Uh, at the same time that that capitalism is the primary cause of mass extinction, is is going to uh, doom us uh, to uh, probably close some of the potential exits from this system. Mm. Like you, you know, you're <laughs> you're you're doubling down on something that has spent centuries. Uh, primarily through, you know, Western colonialism and capitalism, uh, uh, destroying much of life on Earth. Um, and the science is pretty clear that continuing along this path, and, and the science is, you know, we should remember, it's usually a fairly conservative estimate. Mm. Um, you know, like, so when they say um, continuing along this path will mean uh, some estimates say about 50% of a species will be extinct um, by the end of this century. Um, that's like a conservative estimate. People, you know, there are feedback mechanisms and things that, you know, uh, are are maybe difficult to fully predict uh, 50, 60 years from now. Um, 
And, and one thing we've noticed about the International Panel on Climate Change is that uh, because they've been doing this with these annual reports for many years, we know that their predictions are routinely too conservative. And, and we find ourselves saying like every year, well, that, that seems to be happening faster than we anticipated. Yes, um, that's a common phrase that's used often, faster than previously expected or anticipated. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just, I think this. You mentioned this book. Uh, what was the? I'm sorry, the name of it about it was about anarchist uh, politics and mutual aid. Um, dis oh, um, disaster anarchy. Yes, I, I've been. I haven't read it, but I've heard of it, and it sounds like something I would I would be interested in in you know talking about on the podcast at the very least. But um. You know, this is the, I wanted to talk about uh, Brazantic politics. So when we talk about, you're saying like now we're coming to this point where obviously all these crises are, are kind of converging, um, our ability to take exits from this, like de-escalate the destruction of the global, uh, the, the biosphere um, to disrupt the, you know, global climate system and so on. It, it seems, yeah, it seems like if we don't, scale back than the earth <laughs> as a system that is trying to achieve a new kind of stasis or equilibrium is going to just i think kind of do it for us um in a sense and i don't say that as as like it's like choosing or it's like we're getting revenge i don't mean it that way i just mean if the planet's warming it's going to change and it's going to reach a new state of like this is where it's at now right and you know, yeah, you know, cities will not be able to exist on the coastlines any longer in the way that we've we've existed for however many hundreds or thousands of years. Um, our ability to maintain an industrial agricultural system will not be possible, you know, like all the things that we take for granted um, just won't be possible in a planet that is two degrees warmer than it was in the 1700s uh, or before that, right? So, we then approach this question of like, how do we proceed, you know, if there is going to be any livable future at all, which seems increasingly unlikely um, for human beings, um, what, what, what kind of politics can emerge out of that? I think we get into this sort of territory of like, oh, you're anti-civ, you want to blow up all the dams, you want to destroy the electrical grid. You want to, you know, do all this, or you get into this other territory of like Green New Deal. Let's build a bunch of solar panels and wind turbines and, and hydroelectric energy and move to electric vehicles. You know, it's just this sort of like seemingly that is very much a perpetuation of this sort of acceleration of industrialization. You know, it's just instead of maybe focusing as much on fossil fuel extraction, we're thinking about lithium. We're thinking about other like rare earth metals that are required to keep these things to build these um, infrastructures. So I, I would ask if you could talk about what Brazantic politics is, what the root of that is, um, and how we can maybe approach, yeah, this this very brutal future that stands before us. Um, and yeah, you know, potentially de-escalating some of the, uh, um, the brutality of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, th I think um, it's pretty clear that the future, like it will be brutal to some extent. What we're really talking about is uh, making it somewhat less brutal. Like we can still, even though even though there's a certain amount of uh, destruction sort of baked in at this point, like through emissions, for example, that that have not manifest as warming yet. Mm -hmm. Like the mm -hmm. the latest ten or twenty years may not have uh, manifest as uh, warming weather right? right and those are those are the most intense emissions in history yes yeah. um so so there's there is going to be uh some degree of brutality but we can still make better or worse decisions mm -hmm. and i think um we're also I, i'm also thinking in terms of sort of buying some time like mm -hmm. um doing I, I i'm foregrounding a tactic call you know call it brazantic politics uh uh or or whatever but it it it's basically a tactic about either preventing certain infrastructure projects from uh being built like like many of the land defenders in the north of uh canada are are doing with the pipelines that are are you know 
trying to be uh, constructed up there. Um, or uh, in some cases, like we will need, uh, I guess, sort of <laughs> like mainstream society to retrofit things or to use the 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 resources that that they have much more resources than maybe uh, those of us who are um, activists or revolutionaries may may have. Mm -hmm. um, and and then of course sabotage will be necessary in. Uh, some cases because it's pretty clear that um the fossil fuel industries for example have no intention of stepping away from uh trillions of dollars in uh in in their own assets and you know the the future profits that they see in extraction um they they don't think in those terms it's pretty clear from the uh, like the things that they've proposed, the 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 rhetoric that they're using now, um, you know, they they it's it's total nonsense. But they'll you know they talk about um, car, uh, carbon neutrality, so it's it's this farce of a system where they can say, uh, well, we can keep extracting like millions of barrels of oil every day because we planted some trees over there, or or we we paid someone else you know, mm -hmm. to, to plant some trees somewhere, um, or, or like the oil industry here in Alberta has for decades used this idea of reclamation, mm -hmm. you know, where, uh, as, as though they're going to take like the largest environmental catastrophe in history and somehow reclaim the land and make it like as pristine as it was when they found it. Um, yeah. so, so they use, they use a number of strategies to persuade people that continuing to extract at this rate is okay uh, because you see we have these offsets over here, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that makes it neutral. Uh, but, uh, you know, the other, the other uh, sort of uh, fraud is uh, carbon capture and storage, mm -hmm. uh, which is something they've been floating for years and, um, you know, we know it doesn't work. We know that, you know, it's, it's not a solution, but again, it's, I think that their only concern is perception. Um, we know, for example, that the, the oil, the largest oil companies understood the climate science, uh, at least 50 years ago, we know from their internal documents that they, uh, understood the consequences of their industry. And instead of scaling back extraction, they expanded extraction in those 50 years and they spent billions of dollars trying to confuse the public uh, about the science. And so, you know, what makes anyone think that after doing that, mm -hmm. uh, suddenly they're going to, you know, have a conscience and care uh, that that they're you know one of the primary reasons that the the planet is on fire. Um, it's not going to happen. They you know I think their main concern is 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 sort of providing enough of a I guess a rhetorical smokescreen so to speak that that they can continue business um, you know without a serious public backlash. But but really um, I guess if 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 it were possible to concentrate the efforts of uh, of the left um, as such, it would be on shutting down uh, fossil fuel industries. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you you this is where you get into uh, the usual um, uh, sort of rhetoric of the right, which tends to be successful with people. Uh, they they will say you know oh <laughs> you you don't want an oil industry well good luck uh, mm -hmm. freezing in the winter or mm -hmm. you know there's oil in those syringes that you use at the hospital and like it's it it's a dishonest um, argument obviously because everybody knows that there's oil in everything. Uh, in this industrial civilization, the point is that that the fossil fuel industries have been preventing us from transitioning away from much of it. 
Um, you know, the, it's the the fact that they're sort of blocking our uh, ability to transition away from uh, depending so much on oil and natural gas. Um, that's you know that's that's the issue, not the fact that there is oil everywhere. Um, so Brzezantic politics is uh, you know Brzezants is just uh, the shattering effect of an explosive. But what I was thinking of was basically that capital and the state have been enormously successful in building things, mm -hmm. um, okay. and and we're we're at the point that we were long ago, we were at the point in a planetary sense that uh, it is, it is overdeveloped. Like it's, mm -hmm. it is too much infrastructure. Um, it, it is, you know, far too many like uh, cars far, you know, far too much uh, yeah. of everything. And yet, as I point out in the book, like capitalism and the state are continuing to expand these things. They're building, like it's incredible they they're building new airports to service uh you know millions of passengers every year yeah um uh they they ex even here uh in Calgary they expanded the local international airport in the past 10 years um so you know it's it's the idea that if if capitalism and the state are good at uh building for profit like not building in in some sort of humanitarian sense but just uh, uh building things you know for the sake of capitalist metrics like the the ghost cities in china for example you know just these these sort of investments in real estate where no one actually lives um mm -hmm. uh you know or or the examples of uh, there are many examples like that in in all over the world of airports that have been abandoned after being built or uh, yeah. whole neighborhoods abandoned and so forth. And I'm just saying like, we, we need sort of the, the counter to that, which, which is uh, a culture of unbuilding. And mm -hmm. quite frankly, I think it will be uh, a permanent fixture. Like I don't, I don't think in the, in the sense that if like, if the projections for climate change alone are are accurate if this is a mass extinction event um then it could take like the last major mass extinction event took something like 10 million years to recover mm -hmm. right so so i don't think human beings will see the other side of this yeah mass extinction mm -hmm. event um uh yeah so i think we're sort of locked in a permanent battle to to unbuild structures that are are uh, destructive, you know, that are right. against life on this planet. 